This is a talk about AWS and deployment stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into deployment. And so I'm going to try to expose you guys to um, a lot of that, a lot of stuff about deployment. Um, I'm also here with uh, uh, OSS, I guess. Um, so I'm a, uh, I'm Mickey, I'm graduating 2021, I'm a CS major. Um, I've had some experience deploying applications, mostly through HackerU, and also um, some experience uh, being a student systems programmer at Open Systems Solutions. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of this stuff, um, some of this will kind of be my opinion, so be sure to take it with a grain of salt. Um, as for what we'll be talking about, we're going to have, um, I'm going to describe kind of typical setup for applications. I'm not going to go too much in depth about, you know, how to specifically write a back end or a front end. I'm just going to uh, focus more on like, how do you take these things and now put them into production? Um, we'll talk about the differences between deployment, uh, that's supposed to say development and production environments. Uh, we'll talk about various cloud options um, like AWS and Heroku. Uh, depending on time, I'll show some uh, a few demos, and then we'll do a Q and A with OSS, which is a a, a student developer group here at Rutgers. Um, we work for um, underneath uh, messaging and collaboration services, so our uh, the broader group is responsible for doing things like uh, managing Scarlet Mail, but there's also a bunch of other th fun things we handle, and it's a good opportunity to get paid to do dev stuff um, as a student at Rutgers. Um, and we'll talk more about that uh, towards the end in a Q&A. So I guess there's a few different um, typical setups you'll see with applications. Um, so for some, they might have a front end only setup. So that might be just like you have, you know, maybe a static website with just information on it, or it'll, you know, maybe you got some kind of calculator where it's just calculating stuff in your browser, or you've got some kind of app that's using sensors or stuff on your phone. And the idea is that with front end only applications, they're not really going in. Uh, contacting your backend. Um, they, may, they may be using someone else's API, like, um, like maybe the Google Maps API, but there's also um, sort of an older model you'll see is server-side rendered applications or kind of like templates with like PHP. So this is where, you know, you have kind of a backend, but that that server is actually, you know, dynamically generating the HTML and sending it to um, the uh, browser to display. So this is kind of like a dumb client scenario. And, um, you know, you might have like some kind of form and then that submits it and processes it and then renders new HTML and then sends it to you. And the browser is just rendering HTML. Sort of more modern and bigger applications these days will have a nice uh, 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 client server model, basically. So you'll have your front end, which is smart and can do all sorts of different requests to some kind of back end um, server, which just handles like interacting with the database and a bunch of other stuff. So you can kind of see in my picture here, the normal flow, how this works is, you know, someone using their browser will retrieve like the client code, your front end code from, you know, some kind of server, and then it'll run like a React app in your browser. And then that app can then do requests 
to the backend server to handle various things and update um, a database which just stores your, um, you know, the state and data of the application. And um, the reason why the backend server exists is to kind of protect the database because um, if, if you just give like a client direct access to modify the database, um, then, you know, they kind of get free reign to do whatever they want. So by putting the backend server in front of it, you can restrict what they're actually allowed to do with the database and uh, validate things and do extra calculations and stuff. So now moving into stuff strictly about um, production. So, you know, you may have experience running some of your apps just locally on your own machine, um, but once you want to make it available for other people to use or lots of people to use, the situation changes a bit. And you might, you're definitely going to have to figure out a domain. Um, people need to know how to get to your application. So uh, getting a domain, um, you can set up a, a record with your domain, which just maps like, you know, google.com to a specific IP or whatever d your domain is .com and matches that to the IP of your server. Um, you may also be in a situation with especially certain hosting providers where uh, you don't actually know the IP um, beforehand and it's not statically assigned to you. So they might give you some kind of ugly domain that's assigned to you. And then what you can do with a CNAME record is you can point your nice domain to that domain. And then um, it's a lot easier to memorize and you don't have random numbers. Um, another important thing is uh, once people can access your application, you want them to be able to access it securely. So using um, SSL or TLS, you get this uh, certificate and then uh, it can encrypt uh, the traffic between uh, your application and the user. So people can't like intercept it and modify it or anything. Um, there's many different ways you can get access to a certificate. You can sign them yourself. Uh, if you do this, the browser is going to uh, warn someone that goes to your website. You can buy them from a certificate authority. So this is in a, a company that's out there that's trusted that um, can sign your certificates and say, now they trust you. Uh, there's also other options like Let's Encrypt, which is a special certificate authority, um, where basically instead of just having to buy things, you just prove you own the domain and then they're like, okay, here you have this, you get to have a certificate. Um, a lot of times in development setups, you might just have stuff served locally for convenience. Um, but when you have static files, you might want to go with a proxy or a static server like Apache or Nginx. And these kind of servers are very fast at um, uh, just serving static HTML. So like if you just had, you know, say you're writing your application in Python, it might be um, a little bit slower. There's also other advantages where you can um, be able to plug in other common modules. Like if you're using like um, some kind of special authentication or there's a whole bunch of other different plugins you can get for these things that um, you can take advantage of that your language or framework might not have. Um, so in between your proxy server and your backend, you might have to run a application server that knows how to run and manage your program. Um, there are some plugins in the, um, that you can get for Apache and Nginx that can just directly run 
uh, certain types of applications. Um, so it depends on your language and your framework. Um, some examples is like if you're using uh, Java to write your backend, you might have to use Tomcat. If you're writing a um, something in JavaScript, you might have to use PM2. If you're using uh, Python, you'll have to use UWSGI. Um, there's also another important thing to keep in mind for production versus development is you might have different configuration things. So you might have some kind of like auto login that just helps you with development um, that you want to turn off in production or say in production, you might want to use a different database or have the database located in a different place. Uh, and so that's something you can track. You can potentially pass those var variables into your application through environment variables. Um, another thing definitely is logging and saving all of your logs to files and potentially rotating them. So you have a history. If something goes bad, you can go back and check the logs at that time and see um, who is using the application then. There's also, um, you might want to take backups of your database or your application setup. That way, if something explodes, you can set it up. And another critical component of operations is monitoring. So if your application explodes, you want to know about it uh, before the users complain to you. And that way, you can fix it faster or fix it before they even notice. So whenever you go to do a production setup, you know, one of the, the, the three sort of operation stuff that you don't normally anticipate that you need to look out for is making sure you have logging, backups, and monitoring. Um, another thing to think about with um, applications that people might, um, you might have a lot of users is about availability and making sure that you can support that many users. Um, so, Application servers like UWSGI, you can tell it to you to run your application with a specific amount of threads or processes, um, and you can also use um, like Apache and Nginx. You can set up load balance balancing too. So you might even have like multiple servers, and then have Nginx uh, load balancing between those servers. So if someone connects to the load balancer, then it connects it to another backend server. And it just makes it seem like it's all just one big server. Um, another big thing is when you go into production, you definitely want to be able to make sure things are pretty well tested. You can set up automated testing or continuous integration where it just, you know, you push to the repo and it runs a whole bunch of tests. And if you want to be extra fancy, you can get automatic deploys with continuous delivery. So you can set up something where you push to GitHub and then it automatically tests it. And then if the tests pass, then you deploy to GitHub. Um, another short mention about cores, you know, there's potentially random security things that you need to take care of in just convince people that your thing is secure. And then, because um, otherwise you can get a lot of wonky errors sometimes, um, especially related to cores. Um, another important thing is with databases, there are some steps you can do to productionalize your application. Um, like I said earlier, databases help you store and search your data, basically. And a lot of similar things apply with DBs, too, that I just mentioned. But there's some extra things like um, indexes, um, where basically, you know, normally you might have a scenario where if you're looking for 
person number five. It might have to scan through all of the people until it gets to five. Or, you know, if you're looking for person 1,000, it might have to scan through all of the people until it gets to 1,000, and that not, might not be as quick. So what indexes do is you can put it on a specific row or value, and the, uh, the, um, the database will store certain information in memory, kind of like a, uh, a hash map if you've taken 112. And um, it just goes straight to person number 1,000 instead of having to search through the table to find it. Um, and yeah, there's also things like migrations where you might change the, uh, the what kind of data is in your database. So you might set up a migration to automatically put things into the new format when you upgrade. Um, oops. So yeah, a lot of this stuff, especially with deployments can get complicated. And, um, you know, some of these things aren't as important with small personal projects just to like show things to people or show things to friends or let other people use them. Um, for us personally, uh, we use salt with some uh, internal cloud stuff um, because uh, Rutgers has its own like VMs that we use. Um, but there's also a lot of cloud offerings that can manage these various things for you and um, make it a lot easier to deploy things. So moving into the different types of cloud stuff that's out there. Um, there's a lot of asses. Oops. There is... Um, for example, uh, infrastructure as a service. So these are kind of increasing in abstraction. So infrastructure as a service is we just give you a virtual machine and you're responsible for setting all this stuff up basically. Uh, for platform as a service, it will automatically do things like managing upgrades of the operating system, and upgrading packages and a lot of stuff is under under the hood and they'll automatically like set up SSL or um, and for a platform as a service you just um, you just write kind of like your flask application or whatever and you can just upload the application and not have to worry about all of the, the smaller details about deploying things. Um, even more abstract is functions as a service. So in that case, you're not even thinking of uploading a, an entire application. You're just uploading um, functions themselves instead of one big application. And um, the advantage with this especially is for billing purposes because... Um, with uh, platform as a service and infrastructure as a service type things, you might be paying uh, for the application even when it's not being used. Um, but with functions as a service, you pay for every time a function is called. Um, there's also a similar thing where you can get uh, a database as a service where someone manages the operating system and all that sort of thing. Um, and there's even options out there for uh, serving files. Um, so into the specific things that are out there that I've seen um, for infrastructure as a service, there's like AWS EC2 or like DigitalOcean offers VPSs. So this is kind of like, you know, you just pay for a virtual machine in the cloud and you get to set up whatever you want. Um, for platform as a service, there's AWS Beanstalk, and there's also Heroku and Netlify. I haven't used Netlify, but I have used Heroku, and um, those two are 
Heroku, if, if you're looking into deploying a personal project, I definitely recommend um, Heroku. Um, I know people who have used Netlify and really like it. Um, AWS Beanstalk, um, it's out there and it's much easier to use than just using EC2 since with platform as a service things, they'll basically manage um, a lot of things for you. Uh, but since basically how Beanstalk works is it'll set up like EC2 instances and stuff for you. Um, you know, there might be some cost issues if you are like going over free tier limitations. Um, in terms of um, functions as a service stuff, uh, one of the big ones out there is AWS Lambda. And there's also, um, in order to make it easy to manage AWS Lambda, because you know, there's also, you gotta configure it with API gateway where in order to, for people to be able to access it, because basically AWS Lambda is just the functions. And then there's another service called a API gateway, which allows you to um, take in web requests from the internet and route it to the functions. Um, so that can be a little bit complicated to manage, but there's tools out there like the serverless framework, which um, you just have like a config file that sets all of that up and it's pretty nice. And there's also Zappa, which we'll sh hopefully show later, where basically you can have a Flask application uh, written in Python, and then you can run it locally on your machine as if it was a Flask function. And then you can just use this tool to put it on AWS Lambda, and then you get the benefits of um, Lambda for billing reasons, because Lambda is pretty cheap. Um, for storage, um, there's a bunch of different databases out there. Um, if you want a document database, MongoDB Atlas is pretty great. Um, it's not technically on AWS, but it technically is because you go to another website, but the, um, the actual machines that have the servers on it are in AWS if you pick it. Uh, there's also DynamoDB, which is a also a NoSQL database. Um, if you're looking for a more traditional SQL database, there's options like AWS uh, relational data store and AWS Aurora, um, which Aurora, it's kind of like, you know, it, it's uh, like some open source, like databases that are out there, like uh, MySQL and whatever, but it's, it's compatible with that database so that they can do extra things like with uh, Aurora serverless, um, it's set up where, you know, since it's serverless, you don't pay for when the database is like not being used. So I'd actually recommend Aurora serverless over um, RDS or Aurora. Um, there's also Heroku add-ons that you can use for databases, um, which I'd recommend if you're using Heroku. And for, uh, storing hosting websites, uh, there is like github.io or github pages. So if you have a GitHub account, you can get free web hosting for static websites. And then there's also S3 within AWS. Um, it's normally used for hosting files or just having files in AWS but you can also serve a website out of S3 buckets. Um, not pictured here is there's also CloudFront in AWS, which is also useful for, um, it can manage like basically caching your application in various different places. So like instead of just having it served out of, you know, the East Coast, can have it set up where it's going to have it locally on like the East Coast and also on the West Coast and in Europe and stuff. And um, since it's 
locally cached there, people can access it from whichever server is closest to them and you can get faster load times. Um, there's also for uh, logging and for monitoring, there's AWS CloudWatch, um, which is pretty useful. We use that for HackerU. Um, and there's some AWS backup stuff, but usually like um, whatever database service you're using, um, a lot of them have uh, backup stuff built into them. So I definitely recommend if you're just deploying a random personal project and you're okay with uh, Heroku, basically Heroku, when you're not using your application, it'll pause the container to save money. And then when you go to it again, it might take a little bit of time to start up. But um, I definitely recommend that. It has a reasonably nice domain included with um, TLS setup. So basically it's like your app dot heroku app dot com or something like that um and it's pretty low maintenance and easy to use you just uh you know you basically just push to git but instead of pushing to github you push to heroku uh, github.io is pretty good to use if you just have a static site and um for the demo purposes to show you guys some cool stuff and how they interact. Um, I'm going to use um, uh, AWS Lambda. Um, and I actually changed my mind. Instead of using github.io, I'm going to use um, S3 to host files. Uh, there's also a, a pile of links here. So um, before we do the q and I'll put the link to this slide in here. So there's a bunch of useful documentation related to stuff. Um, just to show you really quick though, how easy github.io is to use, you know, basically you just create a GitHub repo called your username.github.io and then you can push HTML to that. And um, if uh, someone goes to just mjrb.github.io it doesn't have a specific file, so it'll default to go to index.html. And um, here's just an example. You go to that, and it goes to uh, a React app that I wrote. Um, so now for the AWS-related demo, which is uh, I'll run through the application really quickly. You know, in this example. You know, I can download the code. Um, I have it on GitHub, I'm pretty sure. Um, basically, if I go into my backend folder and run the backend, it'll say, oh, this is a development server you should not use in production. So we'll talk about what exactly that means. And for this example, I'm just gonna show running it locally. Um, and it's running on port 5,000. Um, and here's basically what it does. It's going to be a guestbook application. So here I got um, a config file that I'm importing where the database is. So the great thing with configs is I can have one config for developing things locally where like the database is just on my laptop. And then I can use another config for uh, when it's in production and then point and say, oh, the database is actually an Atlas now. And um, there's two kind of endpoints that the front end can call here. If it does a get request to guests, then it's going to find and basically get the list of all of the guests that have signed the guest book. And then uh, there's also a uh, post slash guests route that they can go to and that just adds like their signature to the guest book. Um, similarly, I can go into the front end folder and do NPM start and um, run the application locally. 
Um, here I have at the top here, I'm using a library called Axios, which allows you to make uh, web requests from inside of the browser. So all of this code is going to run into the browser. And um, from the browser, I can do web requests to the backend. And here I'm putting on a config so that when I'm developing things locally, I can say the backend's on my laptop. But when I put this into production, it'll actually insert a different URL to wherever it is in AWS. And it's fairly straightforward. I got a component that just lists out all of the guests then another component that's just like a box for people to type in a message. And then here's where the complicated stuff is happening. I've got, um, it's just, uh, you can see when the app first loads, it does client.get slash guests. So that mashes up with the server route where it was handling get slash guests. And that just gets the guest lists and I can display it later. And then I've got this function on guest that gets called every, every time a, um, a person clicks the sign button. And um, that just does a post request to my backend and gives it the uh, data that they put into the thing. And um, similarly, when you run the uh, the front end locally, it'll say, oh, this is a development build. If you want to do a production build, you can do a uh, yarn build, which I do later. Here's an example of what the application looks like. We've got all of the, uh, the messages from previous guests, and I can add a new one, and then it shows up on the list. So I guess uh, kind of to show how things work, I do a uh, um, I did yarn build and then I can come in to here and in the bottom picture, I'm basically just searching through the, um, the, the code that got built. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to read because it's compiled, but I searched through and I can see that the base URL in the built version is actually on port 4,000, which above that I list out the production and development config, and you can see that it does actually work when I have it in production, it's using the production URL. So for AWS, it, it's a lot more complicated than using something like Heroku. And there's a lot of different tiny services that you gotta glue together. Um, in this example, I'm doing everything basically serverless. So I'm not actually having a server that's sitting around doing nothing that I have to pay for. Um, this blue stuff is extra stuff that we may not have, we probably won't have time to go over. Um, but basically the minimum you need to serve the front end is basically in the top left corner, I got a bucket set up and you can configure that bucket to serve out your, uh, or in this case, my React app. And, um, you know, one of the problems is it gives you this long, hairy URL, like uh, the bucket name dot S3 static website, USE stem is on. Uh. So um, one thing you could do is if you do have a domain name, you can apply that directly onto um, the S3 bucket itself, you can say, oh, I'm using the C name, and then you can go into whoever's providing your uh, domain name, and you can point your domain name at the that long URL, and it'll work just fine. But the problem is with S3 buckets, I couldn't figure out how to get it to have uh, encryption on it without putting CloudFront in front of it. So that's why this has some extra setup here. Um, and also in this example, I'm, I'm uh, borrowing the hackeru.org domain because I already had that lying around. You can get domains for cheap if you don't care. You can get like something garbage.club or whatever 
um, for like two dollars from Namecheap. So, but. Um, AWS can actually give you domain names. You can register them there with the service called Route 53. And then with the browser, you go and type in your domain name and then it asks Route 53. And then Route 53 tells you where the website is. And um, also uh, instead of buying domain names from someone, you can also go into AWS and they have something called Amazon Certificate Manager, which basically you just prove that you own the domain and then um, they give you a certificate for that domain. So that's all of the stuff for doing the front end with, um, with encryption and with the uh, domain name. Um, and then there's also for hosting the back end, like I said earlier, it's got API gateway and Lambda, but we're gonna have that set up automatically by the tool Zappa. Um, and also I gotta configure MongoDB because uh, one of the best practices with databases is to use uh, database users to isolate programs from each other. So in this case, I'm going to set up a, uh, a guestbook user on that database that only has access to the guestbook data. And that way you can't use the guestbook to, you know, interfere with the data in any of my other applications on accident somehow. So here's me going into Atlas and I go into my database and I set up the new user and Auto generate you a nice password. Um, and then the one thing you can do is you can click connect and it'll give you a magic string and walk you through how to get your application to connect to Atlas instead of to localhost. Um, now that I got the database set up, I can install uh, Zappa and I can initialize the project to use Zappa and it'll ask you a bunch of questions about your project and get things set up. Uh, before I can actually deploy with this tool, I have to, um, I have to get AWS, the AWS command line set up basically. So all you gotta do is you gotta have some kind of user that has access to whatever you need in AWS. You can go into the security credentials tab and create an access key and download it. And then uh, use the command line locally. Because uh, basically Zappa will use the same credentials that the command line uses. So it's very easy for this one. I just type in Zappa deploy and then it automatically configures all this stuff. And then I get this magic URL that the back end is now at. And um, an example here, I'm just doing curl, oops. I'm just doing curl and um, checking the slash guests endpoint. And here it's just returning an empty array because um, this production version of the back end doesn't have any guests in it yet. So that shows that it works with that magic URL. And then I can take that and put it into the front end config and then build it. Um, and then we got to put in S3. So S3, it's um, a bit more difficult than I wish it was to use, um, but you can just create a bucket and then, um, oops. You can give it a name and select where you want the bucket to exist. And uh, I made a mistake when I was originally doing this. You gotta click, you gotta uncheck the box and allow public access. And then you can go into the settings and say, I want this to host a static website. And like earlier, we gotta give it a page to default to if they don't specify what page they want. And um, it's not quite as simple as just saying um, 
don't block public access. You got to actually allow public access because you got to understand AWS has caught in a lot of heat from people accidentally exposing um, S3 buckets that weren't supposed to be public. So this is a bit more hard than it should be to actually make an S3 bucket accessible. Um, but you can find tutorials where you can copy this policy and set it where um, anyone can read anything, basically. And if you have anything that's private, you definitely don't want to put it in this bucket because then it's public on the internet. And then uh, now that we have the bucket, we can upload our um, React code into it. Um, you just click the upload button. In this case, I actually used the uh, AWS uh, command line to upload the various different stuff. Um, React will just stick it into a folder called build uh, by default. So that makes it pretty easy to figure out what do you upload. It's everything in the build folder. And then um, we see all the stuff is in there. And then, yeah, that was a lot of steps. But now we have the application, and it's there, and we can use it. Um, there's uh, two slight issues, though, that normally that I have um, stuff in here if we wind up having time to show you how I did it. But uh, one here is this, uh, this domain name that it's at is kind of ugly. And also the lock icon has an X through it and it's not using HTTPS. So um, it's not very secure. Um, and you know what, for some personal projects that might be perfectly fine. And so, yeah, I guess um, uh, any questions specifically about the demo or some of this content before we move to the Q&A?